Today, I wanted to talk about preparing the mind for the natural breath. I would really like to get across today mostly that breath meditation is meant to be enjoyable and it's not meant to be a struggle. It's not meant to be something else that you have to get right, that you have to perform, that you have to do, and that you're failing to do, you know, because then the path becomes a path which is not very inspiring or happy. And uh, there's a lovely quote from uh, one of the texts. It's a particular translation in the uh, Majjhima Nikaya Arana Vibhanga Sutta. And there, um, I think it's Nyanati Loka translates uh, a passage. Free from pain and torture is this path. Free from groaning and suffering, it is the perfect path. So this is a path without groaning, except hopefully in pleasure. <laughs> um, and yet for some of us, it can be difficult. And, you know, it's helpful to understand why that is. The Buddha also said that breath meditation in particular is very effective in overcoming thinking, in particular thinking in unskillful ways that aren't anything to do with your meditation practice. And this, of course, is while we meditate, because in daily life we have to use our minds, we have to think. He also said that it's a, a very effective method to overcome what we call the five hindrances, so they're basically things that distort reality, things like craving and ill will, negativity, doubt, worry, restlessness, and, uh, and sleepiness, drowsiness, things that won't allow ourselves to stay calm within ourselves. You know, it, it makes it very difficult for the mind to rest on the breath. We're always being pulled through craving something else, you know, pulled into the future or reminiscing about the past, or we're being kind of repelled away from the object because we just don't feel very comfortable there. So it goes even further in the Buddhist text for those who uh, have a knowledge of the teachings. The Buddha actually said that breath meditation, when completed and developed, um, completes the four satipatthanas. And these are the practices that basically give us an insight into this whole mind-body <coughs> phenomena and the fact that this whole process is conditioned and dependently arisen and it doesn't belong to a self as such. So those four areas that we start to investigate are the mind, the body, uh, the feelings in the body and the mind and the contents of the mind. And so if we practice breath meditation, the Buddha says we can um, actually uh, realize all of that just through watching this breath. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? And when we complete the four satipatthanas, when we understand the nature of the mind and the body, then we complete the seven enlightenment factors. And these are basically the steps towards full awakening, full freedom from <laughs> suffering. Yeah, so isn't, isn't that what we want, actually? I don't know why some of you are here, but I'm presuming it's because you hope that you'll leave the day feeling slightly better rather than worse, <laughs> because we have that natural inclination towards happiness and away from pain. Yeah, it's inbuilt in the human being, in the human mind. But breath meditation becomes difficult, and I think, when it's taken out of context and when we see it as just a practice in and of itself. And for this reason, the Buddha formulated the Eightfold Path. Uh, breath meditation is only one or two of those factors. It's uh, developing mindfulness and developing samadhi, developing calm. But there are six other factors that come before that, that precede that. And without putting those in place, the breath meditation is going to be difficult. So I think this comes or can come as a great relief because it shows us that if we're struggling with the breath and to um, keep our mind on maybe the breath or whatever your chosen object of meditation, it's not because of a lack of ability on your part. It's not because there's something deficient in you or that you don't have the same faculties as every other human being. It's simply because the preparations haven't been done. The foundations are not in place. And so the whole path becomes a path of basically creating the appropriate causes and conditions for breath meditation to become natural, yeah? So our mind naturally 
inclines to the breath when we practice. And breath is just an example. This is what the day's subject is about, but it can be any, any meditation object. So it's natural in the sense that we will incline naturally to it. And also the breath will be natural in the sense that you won't have to force the breath. The breath will be very organic. You're not interfering. You're not trying to make it coarser or shorter or longer. And also the way that the practice unfolds becomes very natural. It becomes effortless, quite organic, yeah, when we have the causes in place. So in other words, we struggle with the breath because we move to it too soon. You know, many of you might be thinking, okay, close my eyes, watch the breath. Come on, <laughs> watch the breath. Oh, the breath's gone away. Grab it away, grab it again and pull it back. Yeah, and we keep doing this kind of grabbing meditation. And uh, it really becomes a drag, you know, you <coughs> mind wanders away, the breath wanders away, you drag it back in again and again and again. And of course, that's going to be really tiring. And it becomes drag meditation instead of pleasant meditation and pleasant abiding for the mind. Um, just for the introduction here, one last thing I want to mention is um, that sometimes another reason we don't have success with breath meditation is because we get the motivation for practice wrong. And often we think of practice as something that's going to give us something or something that is there to bring us attainments or even to make us a better person, yeah? And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that per se, because obviously we want to kind of make ourselves hopefully easier to live with for others, make it easier for us to live with ourselves. But the premise is kind of wrong because it's coming from a sense of self and it's coming from this idea that life is all about what we can get. And we bring that kind of sense of materialism to our spiritual practice as well. Whereas actually the Buddha says that the path of practice goes in the opposite direction to the world. It's against the stream. Against the stream of what? Basically against the stream of craving and acquiring and getting for me. Yeah. So it's going in the opposite direction. It's actually a path of letting go and giving rather than getting. And uh, it's very nice to be in the monastery, which we've just started actually in Oxford. Um, and to see the kind of people coming, one of them's here right now, <laughs> and many other guests have been visiting. And sometimes we have these beautiful conversations where we start to talk about our motives to, for coming to the path. And in many cases, people suddenly get the insight that giving to others is so much more pleasurable than acquiring and receiving from others. Even yesterday we had, uh, it, was, it was the day before yesterday, we had uh, two people come down who were, one of them is our bookkeeper, one of our bookkeepers, and she's serving as bookkeeper just because she wants to give to the project. She has actually no background in bookkeeping, but she was willing to learn just so she could contribute in some way. And they drove down two and a half hours, that's each way, just to feed us. And, you know, people don't just bring like a bag of chips. I, mean, I don't mind if they bring a bag of chips, but <laughs> they bring food that they've been cooking probably the previous evening, you know, and that morning, early morning. And it's made with such attention to detail, such care and such love. And honestly, it's one of the privileges, I think Venerable Pekka might agree, of, of living the monastic life is that we are the recipients of so much, not even the recipients, but we witness so much goodness, so much kindness, and so much generosity, you know? And yeah, it's a training not to take that personally because it's about the other person, it's not about us. They genuinely want to do that. And you can see the joy that it brings. Richard, you've also done that. You've come over to the monastery and given actually many of your Buddha rupas, like statues like this one, a little slightly smaller one, but very precious things that were in your house and that you'd collected for a long time. You know, and people come and give in this way and it's so inspiring. And that's why the Buddha said that is the foundation for the path. Because the whole direction that we want to move in is one of relinquishing, one of giving up giving away, letting go.
Yeah. And even just to say those words, something in me feels like relaxed. <laughs> you know, such a relief not to have all this stuff to guard and to hold on to, but instead to think about others and to let it flow. You know, whatever the gifts I have in my life, whatever I have to share, I can let it flow through me and toward others. And this is such a lovely feeling. It creates a sense of abundance and a sense of community. I, I was just resting in the little uh, classroom over here and on the wall it said, um, we're trying to develop community. Be kind to everyone. <laughs> Actually, I think it said be kind to others. And then I realized this is what we're often taught, but it also includes being kind to ourselves, right? Because actually the two are inseparable. Yeah, anything that's good for you, generally, if it's truly for your benefit, is going to be good for others. If we truly take care of our minds and our hearts and protect them from greed and aversion and resentment, that's going to benefit everyone around us, right? So we have to take care of both. And uh, I usually have too much to say. <laughs> so I did want to go through the first few factors of the path a little bit uh, in this first talk. And later on in the afternoon, we'll get on to the, um, the kind of steps of breath meditation. But just to create a little bit more of a foundation for our practice, um, the Buddha said, you know, that the path starts with right view. And I think for many people, conditioned in you know from western or capitalistic backgrounds maybe societies where we're taught to question we can be a little bit ooh right view what's right about it is that some kind of judgment or some kind of dogma but really it only means right in the sense that this kind of view leads to freedom from suffering and the buddha says again and again you know that he teaches two things suffering and the end of suffering so we can frame the entire path in this way. You know, whatever he's saying is right, is right in the sense that it leads us out of suffering, step by step, of course. And suffering extends from the slightest sense of discontent or something not quite giving you what you hoped it might, all the way through to obviously traumatic events that happen or, you know, losses of people we love or old age, sickness and death, right? Suffering can be very intense at times. But the word suffering, it's a translation, and it, you know, it, it includes a whole um, spectrum of unsatisfactoriness, you could say. Yeah. I mean, death is more than unsatisfactory, right? Most of us would be like, I don't want to die. <laughs> so I do think the word suffering is quite, um, quite relevant there. But um, as part of right view, you know, the Buddha encourages us to appreciate that suffering, appreciate that whatever we have now is not completely fulfilling. It's not the final kind of mm, summit of the mind, yeah? There is that sense of discontent in all of us and it can change at different times in our lives. And also that suffering has a cause, yes? Because if you just said, okay, it's suffering, see you later, that's it, I'm, I'm off to meditate under a tree, I don't think we'd be here right now, but the Buddha didn't do that. Out of compassion, he showed the cause of suffering, and he showed us how to eradicate that cause, yeah? And for me, when I first heard that teaching, it was such a big relief, because I knew I was suffering in different ways, and yet I almost felt like I wasn't allowed to, it wasn't really okay because I have everything materially that I could want. And yet there was this sense of why am I here? What's the meaning of this? And why do human beings cause each other so much harm, so much pain? So for me to hear that, you know, suffering is a reality of life, somebody's acknowledging that and giving a way out was just an enormous relief. And that gave me a different response to suffering, a response of compassion. You know, the response of wanting to understand, having empathy and having compassion for the suffering in myself and that I could see all around. Um, and so it's a very optimistic teaching. And I think this is one of the purposes of, of right view that, you know, it brings that sense of optimism. Okay, there's a path. And secondly, right view includes the teaching on cause and effect. So I'm avoiding the word karma because the word karma has been misused to mean some kind of fate. Um, 
and actually karma is the action itself. It's what we're doing now. Um, so in a sense, it's the causes that we're putting in place. And the effects of those causes are what the Buddha called vipaka. So cause and effect, karma, vipaka. To basically appreciate that our actions have consequences. They have effects for ourselves, within ourselves, and for others as well. And once again, this is highly empowering. You know, it's optimistic to realize that we can actually become aware of that and we can modify the causes that we put in place in order to yield pleasant effects, effects that will be beneficial for ourselves and others. You know, for example, I was sleeping last night or trying to sleep in a very nice hotel arranged by London Insight uh, just down the road. And everything was lovely. I was ready to go to bed and have my earplugs. I thought, great, I'm going to get a quiet night. And it was so hot. <laughs> it was really hot. They had the heating on full blast. And, um, you know, as, as much as I could, I kind of, you know, wore very few bed sheets and stuff. But I was just sweating. And I realized at about two in the night, I'm not going to sleep. And uh, so I just enjoyed the silence. And I realized, OK, I'm not going to sleep. But maybe that doesn't matter. Like, I don't need to make a big fuss out of that. And also knowing I have to teach today, I know that if I would have started to worry and panic and think, oh gosh, I'm going to be brain dead in the morning, uh, I would have had a really bad night. But I just decided, okay, it doesn't mean anything. This has happened before. Uh, and somehow, you know, when you're sharing the Dhamma, something else comes up from inside. It's not only the brain that has to work. It's, you know, it's the act of giving again. It's the act of sharing. And so, you know, our actions, our reactions have consequences. I could have wound myself up into a really tight knot and, uh, and been really frustrated and, you know, cancelled the retreat, which I wouldn't do. <laughs> or you can lie there awake and just make peace. You know, OK, this is the situation. How can I keep my mind quiet? And sometimes I just pretended that I'm in this lovely kind of floaty place on a sort of dinghy or something on the ocean. It was very comfortable, so it was quite easy to do. And uh, obviously that has more beneficial effects than the opposite. So it also, right view also gives us the perspective of gratitude. You know, the Buddha says that we have parents, and I know that some of us haven't had a good time at all with our parents, but as one person recently said, at least they gave him life. At least they gave him this human life that he could practice with now, you know. And so to appreciate that we didn't come here alone. We came here through the gifts of many. Um, if you don't feel gratitude to your parents, then, and I'm sure most of us do, it's okay if you don't. You know, some people have had horrendous childhoods, and that's a process of healing that you may need to go through. But all the people who helped us in the hospital, to deliver us, you know, and the people who looked after us in the first years of life, our teachers, etc. So this all gives a perspective, you know, on our lives and helps us to realize that the practice is not only for us, you know. Again, whatever we do will impact others. And, and in a sense, we have um, a responsibility to others as well to give something back. Um, and then lastly, you know, he um, says that as part of right view, um, one of the reflections is that there are people in the world, and that includes today, it says recluses and Brahmins because they were the holy people in the Buddha's day, um, that have actually seen the truth, that have penetrated the Dhamma, that are such beings alive. And to think of that should give us inspiration because it's not that they're special or different from us. It's, again, this cause and effect process. If the practices that they do have yield those results, then surely if we take up those same practices, eventually we'll experience the same effects. It's just a matter of time, and sometimes we can get impatient with that. So for me personally, knowing beings in this world who do seem to have ended suffering, you know, and who do seem to run on metta, loving kindness, compassion, equanimity, <laughs> and sympathetic joy for others, is just so inspiring to me that there are human beings alive, you know, that you can, you're not allowed to touch if they're male, but you know, <laughs> they're females too. And um, yeah, it's just amazing to think that uh, 
the Dhamma is still so accessible today. It's universal, it's timeless. Um, it's just as relevant as it ever was because the human mind is the human mind. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's what we have as human beings. And even across cultures, there's barely any difference there. You know, there are differences on the outside. Some cultures might be a little bit more inward focused, some are a little bit more gregarious, sometimes it's climatic changes, you know, societal differences. But essentially, we all have this range of happiness and suffering, and we're going to go through the whole lot at some point. So <clears throat> hopefully this brings inspiration rather than they can do it and I can't. Um, because again, that's a self view. I, you know, and it is a process of cause and effect. So when we have this right view, the beautiful thing about it is that um, it's something we can observe inside. We can actually observe the results of the way our minds uh, behave or the way, you know, our bodily and verbal conduct is. We can observe those results immediately. You know, it's, um, it's something we can learn from. And this can lead to faith. You know, faith in the Buddha's teachings, but also faith in ourselves. You know, faith that we have that inner wisdom to be able to, again, kind of direct the mind in wholesome ways, as the Buddha said, that lead to pleasant consequences and pleasant results. So the next factor in the path, which I will go through as briefly as I can, is a right motivation. And this is a very important part of the path in a sense, it's the how to develop that good karma. What is that good karma? So the three right motivations are where the action is, so to speak. And it's the way we relate to what arises in our lives, in our experience, in our meditation, in our minds. And the first of those right motivations is letting go. <laughs> So again, it's on the same trajectory as giving, yeah? So it's letting go, for example, in breath meditation of the desire, first of all, to get onto the breath and have results with the breath. And also this uh, tendency that many of us can have to kind of grab that breath and possess it, you know, or possess our meditation. This is my meditation. Um, which makes the whole thing quite miserable. <laughs> and instead, when we can, you know, let go of that desire for outcome, that desire for result, we can instead focus on uh, what we're bringing to the practice. So the second of those right motivations is actually the attitude of loving kindness. So we let go of the clinging, the control, the possession, and instead we think about how we can relate in a, in a compassionate and a benevolent way. So if the breath goes, the breath goes, you know. Loving kindness is unconditional. So you don't beat yourself up about that. And there's a very nice example that um, my teacher Ajahn Brahm gives of the child that leaves home. <laughs> and there was this little child, I think there were a couple of them actually, but one he speaks about was in Singapore. And one day this little child said, Mommy, I don't love you anymore, I'm leaving home. And the mummy didn't say, oh, no, no, you know, don't be silly, darling, I'm sorry, or, you know, it'll be better soon. She said, okay, darling, I'll help you pack. <laughs> <laughs> this four-year-old, four you know. So she helped him pack his little suitcase and uh, apparently put him in the lift because in Singapore they don't kind of walk down the front garden, they go down the lift. And uh, she didn't pack him lunch, but she gave him a few dollars as well to get some noodles, presumably. And, uh, and this little boy went down the lift, all packed up, ready for his life. <laughs> and the mother was very wise. She knew, you know, that he'd be back, probably because of the loving kindness that she had towards him and the freedom, right, that she gave for him to learn for himself. So he got down to the bottom of the lift, and then presumably he met some sort of lift attendant and found his way back up, said, oh, I need to go back to mommy. So when he went back up in the lift, the doors opened and there she was. Oh, welcome home, darling. I missed you. It's lovely to see you again. 
So this is really beautiful. It's a lovely attitude. And imagine if we could have that attitude towards our breath. So the breath says, right, that's it. You controlled me the minute you saw me. <laughs> you know, you tried to change me. You tried to grab me. I don't like being grabbed. So the breath says, that's it. I'm off. <laughs> I probably won't come back. And in the meantime, the mind's like, oh, this is terrible, I can't. I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about that. Ah, I'm hopeless at breath meditation. Instead of that, the mind acts like that loving mother. That's okay, breath, if you want to go. I'm here for you, I'll wait. And we wait with that patient, loving kindness for the breath to come back. So the breath knows, okay, when I am ready to come back, someone will be there with patience, with kindness, to receive me back into the mind. And that way, when the breath does come into the mind, we can actually enjoy it rather than being so worried that, you know, it's going to slip away again or so worried about whether we're doing it right or not, you know, whether we're observing the whole breath or not. This is really less important than the attitude we have. So, you know, if we can be that benevolent mother that's patient, that's accepting, or father or friend, whoever for you is an example of benevolence, you know, and we have that benevolence inside, then the breath will want to stay because everyone likes to be with a friend, right? And then the other part of the right motivation is um, what is translated as kind of non-violence. It's called avihimsaka, and uh, it also includes compassion, like an understanding and appreciation of suffering but a response that, that cares, a response of tender concern, if you like. You know, so sometimes our minds might not be very happy. Um, and the tendency is to want to change our experience, want to get some pleasant experience instead. But compassion would rather be able to meet that suffering and ask, how can I care for this moment? How can I care even for the breath right now? You know, maybe it's it's hard or it's uh, contracted or maybe you've got asthma or some kind of sickness and it doesn't feel very comfortable. How can I just care for this and be tender and gentle with it? Um, how can I be nonviolent, not wishing it to change, not trying to make it something it isn't, but just staying and accepting it as it is? And another aspect of that uh, nonviolence is being gentle. And I think this is... Uh, really key to the practice because we often think we're being gentle. We think we're not interfering or controlling, but we can always be a little bit more gentle, sit back a little bit further in our mind and really try not to interfere. My teacher once told me, you know, you have to be gentler than gentle because even gentle, even being gentle is a certain doing and we're trying to overcome that energy of doing and get into the energy of receiving, the energy of knowing, allowing instead. And also I think an aspect of that uh, gentleness is patience with the process. Yeah, patience with the process of meditation. Patience with suffering. Again, you know, seeing it as an opportunity to be kind, to be compassionate, rather than wanting it to quickly pass. Because I think a certain amount of suffering in life not that we bring it on or we look for it, can build strength of character, strength of mind, if we have the right attitude to it. You know? Otherwise, there's a danger of being complacent. And I think that's so, especially in so-called first world countries, you know, where all the comforts are at our disposal. <clears throat> of course, many people struggle with the economic crisis and all the rest, but it's very different from practicing in an Asian country on a wooden floor, you know, or sitting on lumpy concrete in sort of 45 degrees plus plus humidity and having very, very basic food. And sometimes that little bit of austerity or little bit of physical suffering can help us to really turn inside to find our refuge. So sometimes if the chair's a little bit hard today or <laughs> if your knees start to ache, you know, don't reject that. You know, see that as an opportunity to develop that right intention toward it. And then you're on the path. <coughs> so this right motivation leads to naturally right action of body and speech. And this is the first really important 
indispensable part of the path. It's the foundation, the sealer, the virtue, the virtuous conduct. And uh, I wanted to start the meditation actually with some reflections on our own virtue because this is something that's quite counterintuitive to most of us. I'm sure that many of us here have really good livelihoods. You know, we've tried our best to be parents or good parents or good kids. Um, you know, all of you here have an interest in Dhamma, which is extraordinary because that's all about learning to be kind, right? It doesn't mean we're perfect. And it's not that the, our virtue has to be perfect to start to practice, but we're trying our best. You know, and the Buddha says in the suttas that uh, even more important in a sense than getting it right is to be honest about our actions of body and speech. So he says, always reflect before, during and after you do anything to see is this for my own benefit, for the benefit of others and for the benefit of both. Of course, both is the best. Yeah? Or does it lead to affliction? with painful consequences and results. So we have to reflect, and he told his own son to reflect in this way. Not to beat ourselves up, but again, to learn about cause and effect. <clears throat> and, you know, how can we really know that it is virtuous? And the Buddha said, if it is, then it leads to immeasurable benefit for countless beings. And it also gives them freedom from fear, freedom from enmity and freedom from affliction. And we ourselves in turn enjoy that freedom from enmity, affliction and fear. Yeah? So that means by practicing virtue, we give ourselves the gifts of kindness, right? Freedom from enmity. We give ourselves the gift of safety and trust, freedom from fear. And we give ourselves, you know, this sense of ease and well-being that happens when we're at peace with ourselves. So it has so many beautiful benefits. And I think it's a shame sometimes that we have such, you know, goodness in our hearts, but we don't really care to reflect on it. And a couple of years ago, my teacher told me something very interesting. He said, oh, in me, the channels are open in himself, this is. The channels are open for him to celebrate his own goodness because he doesn't take it personally. He's just able to see the, the beauty of his life. And he said most people or many people have those channels wide open to self-criticism. So sometimes we have this feeling like we shouldn't bring up our happiness or our goodness or our generosity. You know, we shouldn't think about it. We did it without, you know, expecting anything in return. So we shouldn't even like recollect it in some way. And yet we're very willing to go over and over and over all the things we've done wrong, <laughs> which is kind of illogical and quite hypocritical, really, isn't it? Because that's so unfair. <laughs> you know, it's the way that somebody in court would kind of treat you if they wanted to prove you guilty. Whereas really what we need is our own inner advocate. <laughs> you know, somebody inside that says, hey, I see you're doing well. I see you're trying your best. Yeah, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. But on the whole, you know, I can be happy with my life. I don't know, sometimes for me it's very beautiful to think these ways and uh, to realize that if I was going to pass away or from lack of sleep or whatever, <laughs> um, <laughs> sometimes you feel like that. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd be quite happy with the life I'd lived, you know? I mean, sure, I would have liked to do a bit more meditation in the past few years. I've been very busy starting a monastery, which has taken a lot more time and energy out of me than I expected because you don't really know what you're getting into with these things. But at the same time, you know, given the conditions I've had, I've done my best and it benefits others. Um, you know, sometimes other people write and they say, I actually had a letter from someone in Australia, which was surprising because they're so far away and uh, they'd listened to a few of the talks on Dhamma that I gave over the new year. And they said that they were close to ending their life but not after the talks. <laughs> that, come, that could sound strange. <laughs> but uh, yeah, before listening, uh, they were really, you know, not sure what to do or if they wanted to continue living. And then they started listening and it was sort of after a few talks and then hearing some of the chanting 
surprisingly, that they said, I know I'm going to be okay. And that was just, you know, when you receive that kind of email, it's like, wow. I mean, you really don't know, and this is not only me sharing Dhamma, this is anybody who's doing incredible things that you're doing in your lives, you know. There are people here who've probably saved the lives, if not of human beings, of, you know, animals or whatever. There are people who've maybe adopted children who, you know, wouldn't have had much of a chance. Um, there are people here who are doctors, I'm sure, or teachers or social workers, or even if you work as a bus conductor, you know, you can be really cheerful with your passengers when they get on the bus and really brighten their day. So, you know, there are so many ways that we all contribute in life and make a big difference because we never know what a person's going through. And when they meet that person with a smile and with that extra gesture of kindness, it can really turn things around. So it's really important to reflect on these things because it also changes our perception of the world, you know? If you read newspapers and get on those social media feeds that are all about the things going wrong, you can just get sucked into this vortex of negativity and, <laughs> You know, that creates your worldview. It's almost like you are primed to expect that when you go out into the day. Whereas if we can go out with much more of a positive perception, a mind that's able to see the good in ourselves and in others, then, you know, we're likely to actually uh, notice that more and more. You know, whatever we dwell on basically becomes the most predominant thing to us. So if we can learn to dwell on our own inner goodness, that can be a massive source of energy and confidence and most importantly, a source of happiness on the path. So this breath meditation, in a way, only takes off when there is that gladness, that happiness in our mind, you know. And that becomes, in a way, the glue that kind of keeps you with the breath because there's happiness, there's satisfaction and contentment there. 